Claudia, I'm Francesco Rabona, I'm a faculty here uh, in the EC department and I will tell you something about what I call parameter-free machine learning. So uh, if, you, if you read the news in these days, uh, you will notice that uh, people keep saying that machine learning will be, is actually the motor of the next industrial revolution. Um, they say that uh, self-driving cars are a few years away and uh, in a while we'll basically have machine learning in every aspect of our life. Now, uh, there is a small dirty secret in, in all this is that uh, the, this big revolution that, that came a few years ago is driven not by new algorithms. Uh, there is actually nothing new. Uh, the algorithms are still the same from the 80s. Uh, the only thing that allowed to uh, this, this big revolution was the fact that uh, we have better software, we have a lot of data, and we have better hardware in the form of GPUs. And this is why now we have better performance. Now, this means that also that given that the algorithms are still the same, we still have the same shortcomings of the old algorithms. So in particular, the human is still a critical component in the machine learning process. So it's not that you know, uh, laymen would imagine that you know, machine learning is just about throwing data to a computer and then getting a solution, but it's actually a process in which there is a human there that is you know, looking at things and then nothing works and then changing something and then still nothing works. And this process goes on for a while until you get good performance. And so in particular, if you think about deep learning, there are a number of choices that you have to make. For example, how many layers, how many neurons, if you want a convolutional neural network, or the activation function, the learning rate, all these things, they are critical to, the, to obtain good performance. The, the, the algorithms are very brittle. If you change these things just a little bit, the performance will drop by a lot. Sure, there are a lot of solutions to automatize all these choices, but it's not the state of the art. The state of the art, if you really want to have you know, the best performance and win competitions, is there is somebody that is staring at numbers and deciding what to do at each moment. So this is true, for example, if you want to turn a learning rate, there is a guy looking at, at the curve and at a certain moment says, oh, this is the right moment to halve the learning rate by half. Now, it's clear that this is not a scalable approach. I mean, you, you cannot, we cannot hope to extend these things to a lot of tasks. So uh, my role, the, the, the things uh, that I am mostly interested in is understanding what is the role of these parameters. We have all these machine learning algorithms that are not automatic, and we have a lot of things that we have to choose. And I try to understand what is the role of these parameters, and then I try to understand if these parameters are necessary or not. Are th is there is something intrinsic in the algorithm that makes the fact that the parameters should be there, or we, are, we were just lazy when we designed the algorithms in the first place. So can we change completely the algorithm to remove the parameters? So, for example, I'm interested in questions uh, like, is Adam, that is sort of considered the state-of-the-art optimization algorithm for uh, deep learning, really automatic and better than undergrad? Is the learning rate really necessary? Is the regularization par parameter really necessary? And the answer to all these questions is actually no. Uh, all these things are not necessary. It's just that we didn't know how to do. And so we designed the algorithm that way, but we can do better. So for example, the kind of things that I do are the following. Uh, you want to train a deep neural network. You basically gather your data, you decide all the structure of your network, and then you have to choose the optimization algorithm. There are a bunch of the out there that are considered the state of the art. Adagrad, RMS prop, uh, Ada Delta, Adam, these are all choices that you have to make. You can just try all of them and then choose the one that works the best, but still each one of them has a parameter, so you will spend a lot of time it's, you can automatize the process, but still, you know, it's computation that you waste. In alternative, you can just use another algorithm that does not have any parameter at all. You just run it once, and you get better performance than all the others. So this is what I do. This is my research. Now, of course, it doesn't work that well as the slide that I just showed you, but, you know, I had to impress you. Uh, so let me explain a little bit more in details this particular example of my research. And in order to do that, I have to tell you something about gradient descent, that it's the core of machine learning in the end. All these fancy algorithms are nothing else than finding the minimum of, of the function, nothing else, that is really. 
So basically, it means that you have a function like that, and you want to find the minimum of the function. So in particular, you, find, you want to find this point here. So how would gradient descent work? Gradient descent works in this way. You start from a point at random. So let's say that you start from zero. You evaluate the gradient. The gradient tells you in which direction you should go, like on a roller coaster, and you go down in that direction. The point is that it doesn't tell you about how much you should move in that direction. It just tells you the direction. So there is a parameter that is called learning rate that basically tells you by how much you jump each time. Now, if you if the jumps are too small, it will take you forever to reach the minimum just because the jumps are too small. If the jumps are too large, you will quickly reach the area of the minimum, but then you will never converge because you cannot be more precise than the jumps. Uh, okay, fine, this is gradient descent. Uh, do we have any better than that? Do we have any other algorithm? What about Adagrad that was, uh, you know, the beginning of these adaptive uh, algorithms? This is what Adagrad would do on this example. Nothing too smart, I have to say. The only thing that he would do is that over time, the step sizes, the jumps that you make, would decrease. And now you have the advantage that sooner or later you will be precise enough to the optimum because sooner or later the step size will be small enough. But that's it. This is the only advantage that you have from using Adagrad over the standard uh, gradient descent. And still, you have that the first jump is the critical one. It's still a parameter. It's still there. You still have to choose. It still will govern how fast you will converge, because if it is too small, again, it will take you forever. If it is too large, again, it will take you forever. OK, so what do we know uh, from a theoretical point of view? Uh, this is the SGD algorithm. We just update each time in the negative direction of the gradient, multiplied by eta, that is the step size. We know that from a theoretical point of view, we should choose a step size of the order alpha over square root of small t, where small t is the iteration number. And we know that the convergence rate, uh, basically the difference between the average of your solution and the optimal one, is of this form. So it's 1 over square root of capital T, where capital T is the number of iteration that you do. So basically, the more iteration you do, the more you will approach the minimum. You will approach it very slowly, but you will approach it. Now, the important thing is this other term here that depends on alpha. Alpha is this number here that you have to choose, the one that you put inside your algorithm. That is typically is 0 0.01 in deep learning. This is the magic number. Uh, now, if you look at this alpha, uh, you see that there is a trade-off between these two terms. And, and you can just calculate the derivative with respect to alpha, solve for it, and you will find that the optimal alpha is just the distance between the optimal solution and the initial point. That's it. That is the optimal number that you should plug there. The problem is that you don't know the optimal solution. You're looking for it. So this theoretical thing is completely useless at the end of the day. And, and there is something more. This quantity might be infinite because the optimal solution might be at the infinite. For example, if you do logistic regression with, on a linearly separable data set, x has actually norm equal to infinity because you are trying to transform the sigmoid into a step function, and this, this happens only at infinity. So there is nothing that we can use out of this theory. So is this the best that we can do? Are we doomed to have this learning rate around? And it's actually no. There is, by now, quite a little bit of papers on this idea of doing optimization and in general, online learning without parameters, parameter free. Uh, now, uh, these papers are not all by me, and this is a good thing because it means that there is a community that is working on these things. Uh, and, and we are still producing. I mean, the, the, these latest two papers were from this summer. And so we know how to do these things. It's a known thing. It's, it's mainly uh, the work from theoretician, but still, it's known. So in the following, I will explain you what's the trick beyond these techniques based on these three papers. Uh, and I will start from another problem. Instead of solving, trying to solve optimization, I will tell you a little bit about another problem that is the idea of betting on a coin. Now, bear with me, and then you will see what's the connection between betting on a coin and optimization. Betting on a coin is a very simple game. You start with a dollar, and you want to bet money on the outcome of the coin. Uh, each round, you decide how much money you want to bet on, each, on which side of the coin. If you win, you win money one-to-one. Money one. If you lose, you lose money one-to-one. One. Okay, very simple. You cannot 
borrow money. If you lose all your money, you lost. Uh, the aim of the game is to win as much money as possible. Okay? Now, this is a very old problem. And for the first time, it was solved in 56 by Kelly in Bell Labs uh, with a strategy that is called Kelly betting. It's a very general framework. Uh, but when you instantiate to this particular problem, you basically have that you should bet, you should assume that the coin is stochastic. And you should assume that you know the bias of the coin. And the strategy, the optimal strategy is super simple. It, Kelly just says you should bet a fraction of the money that you have in each round that is equal to two times the bias minus one. So for example, if you know that the bias of the coin is 0 0.51, it's not a fair coin, but it's slightly biased, you should bet 2% of the money on the side that will likely appear more often. That's it, blindly. It doesn't matter if you win or lose. Every time you take 2% of the money, you, you bet on that. Now, roughly speaking, there is an expectation in the middle, but it's still roughly speaking, if you follow this approach, the money will increase exponentially. So you will win a lot of money using this simple strategy. Now, there is a problem here that we are assuming that the coin is stochastic and we are assuming that you should know the bias of the coin. Can we remove these two assumptions? And again, yes. And again, this is known things. No, these were not done by me. Uh, here, now we don't assume anything anymore. The coin is an arbitrary sequence of outcomes. It can be de determined in any way. It doesn't matter. It will work anyway. We still use a Kelly betting approach, but now we don't know the probability because the coin does not even have a probability because it's not stochastic. So you estimate something that is like a probability. So it's a probability in quote. At each round, you basically count the number of heads. Let's say that heads is the one that is appearing more often in the past. You add one half and you divide it by number of rounds plus one. That's it. This is your estimate. And then you use Kelly betting. So again, you bet a fraction of the money that is two times this probability minus one. Okay? Now, if you do that, it's possible to prove that your money will still increase exponentially. And this term here, here uh, on top is actually optimal. It's the exponential rate that depends on how much biased is the coin. The more it's biased, the more you win money. And this term on the bottom here is how much you pay for the fact that you don't know in advance how many head and how many tails there are in the entire sequence. If you knew that, if you knew the future, you would not pay this two times square root of t. Okay? Given that you don't know the future, this is the only price that you pay. But you're winning an exponential amount of money and you're paying a square root of t term. So you're paying nothing. So basically, this means that you can always min win money at this game. This game is easy. The optimal strategy is incredibly simple. And there is another Im very important thing. There are no parameters. There's nothing to choose, nothing to, to, uh, you know, to, to decide here. This is a fixed thing. One half is one half. There is nothing to decide. So what's the connection between these and optimization? Well, the connection is the following. This is my contribution. I can reduce any optimization problem to betting on a coin. And once you do that, you can use the optimal algorithm to do betting that was parameter free to do optimization without parameters. So the strategy is the following. You can use any betting strategy. You don't have to use the Krzyzewski trophy or estimator or any, anything that you like. But it does, it does, you have to use a strategy that guarantees you to win some money. So for example, for Krzyzewski trophy, we have this guarantee, this exponential guarantee. Now let's say that we want to minimize the function absolute value of x minus 10. That was the function that I showed you at the beginning. The reduction is the following. Every time the betting strategy tells you to bet some money, that is the x that you query on the function. You query the gradient on that point. The gradients of this function are just plus 1 or minus 1, exactly a coin. So that is the outcome of the coin. Then you win or lose money. The strategy tells you how much money you should bet in the next round. That is the next x. That's it. This is the entire thing. Now, if you follow this very simple recipe, the average of your bets will converge to the minimum of the function. And not only that, the better your strategy is at making money, the faster you will converge to the minimum of the function. Um, let's do a later question because I have, have more slides. Uh, I can prove that, but we will not go over it. But the point is that the proof is simple. And so this means that you can just now do stochastic gradient descent with a betting algorithm. You just have to use the average 
of almost the average of the past coin, so almost the average of the past gradients, multiplied by the current wealth that you have. The current wealth is what? The initial dollar, and how much you're winning or losing at each round. And you're betting money X, and you're observing the coin that is the gradient, so that is, this is the, this is the algorithm. This is the entire algorithm. It's as simple as stochastic gradient descent. There's nothing more difficult than that. Now, the entire thing works only 1D, and only if the gradient is plus one or minus one, because you have a coin, you need a coin. But I can extend that these to an arbitrary number of dimensions, even infinite. So the entire thing works anyway. These, these are now vectors, you average vectors. This is an inner product, but it's fine. Also, if you have expectation, it works. This means that you can use mini batches. The entire thing wor will work. OK, let's skip this. Uh, let me show what's, what's how the algorithm would work in practice. Basically, in the first round, Kelly Betting tells you count things in the past and they, they decide what to do, but there is no past in the first round. So the optimal thing in the first round is to bet zero money. And so the first x is zero. You query the gradient in zero, and then and you receive a minus one. This is the first gradient. So in the next round, Kelly Betting tells you bet some money on minus one, and you move in this point, and you won money because the next gradient is the same, and the same, and the same, and the same. And you keep winning money. And the more money we win, the exponentially faster you reach the interesting area. Once you are here, at a certain moment, you, be, will, you will jump on the other side. And when you jump on the other side, you are still betting on observing a gradient of minus one, but then you observe another gradient of opposite sign. So you lost your bet. The moment that you lost your bet, automatically the algorithm will backtrack because the next bet has to be small because you don't have much money. And so when you take the average, the algorithm will have this nice behavior that will converge as fast as possible to the minimum. Now, if you think for a moment about this picture, this is completely different from any other optimization algorithm that we have out there. The other algorithms, they say, you should keep the step size constant. This is what Adam is doing. Or you should decrease the step size. This is Adegrad. This is then says, go as fast as possible to the interesting area. And then we will worry about decreasing the step size once we are there. But it's, it's useless to decrease the step size when you are far from the optimum. OK. Um, now, the entire strategy can also be applied to deep learning. And it's very simple. You just use one coin on each weight of, your, of the network. You also take advantage of the sparse gradients. So there is some technicalities here, but uh, it's basically the same algorithm as before. Uh, and you can do more. You can do SVM without regularization in the same way. You can do online learning with changing environments. That, that was the talk by Quang. Uh, you can use any norm. You can, use f you can have faster uh, rates if the function has some kind of curvature, everything in a very automatic way. You don't have to do anything. The algorithm will take care of it. Now, let me show you in a couple of slides that this actually works. It's not only theory. So what I did, I, I used the, you know, the usual machine learning experiments. So this is a MNIST convolutional neural network. And I compared a bunch of state-of-the-art algorithms. But for each one of them, I tuned their parameter. And how I tuned them, I just tried all of them on a super fine grid. So the experiments took weeks. And for each one of them, you have the optimal parameter. And this is their, their curve. And then you have my algorithm, that is this COCOB in red, that doesn't have anything to tune. You just run it, and it will work. And by the way, there is a TensorFlow code. So if you want to try it, it might work. Uh, I have also another experiment. This was prediction of words. And the results are more or less similar. But let me tell you. An, I think something more convincing on why this algorithm works. You know, when you show experiments, they're always good. Otherwise, you don't show them. So let me show something different. Uh, I discovered basically one month ago that somebody used my algorithm, because the code is online, to win a Kaggle competition. I have no connection whatsoever with this guy. He didn't even tell me that he, he was using my algorithm. He just you know, downloaded the code on, online. He, he went there, he won the competition, and then he published the entire code of the co that he used on GitHub. So he's still there. You go there, and you will find that he said, I used Cocob Optimizer. And why he used it? Because he said, 
I don't have to train the learning rate anymore. I have much more time to run more experiments and to try more things, and this allowed him to win the competition. And I think this is a very convincing thing, because in the end, you know, my message is, the algorithm does not have a parameter. You should not do anything. And this guy didn't have any knowledge of the algorithm, he just used it. Okay, so that's it. Uh, thanks for your attention.